Record to the cloud. Are we recording? I think so. Hey everyone, it's a live app review. And today we're talking about the, um, the NFT market. So um, let's go to GitHub here to the actual repo. Whoops. Um, so it's github.com slash near dash apps organization and it's NFT dash market. Uh, this is the one we're talking about today. So we're in the app right now and we're explaining a little bit about the uh, marketplace flow. Um, so I'm just going to refresh. I'm going to look at an NFT that I own. Uh, by the way, we're, we're on testnet and we're also, we're kind of live in the front end. So, you know, no local hosts, no nothing here. So um, we had a question from Zahar about the, um, the sort of mechanics around what happens, how do you put up your NFT for sale? So this is the NFT uh, that I have. The NFTs exist in the NFT contract, but they need to be put up for sale in the marketplace contract. And, and this sort of cross-contract call needs to be relatively you know, general. Um, it, you know, general or standard in a sense, because if the user is on the front end of the marketplace, the marketplace prepares some, uh, some piece of JSON, then the, the client calls the NFT contract, and then the NFT contract calls the marketplace contract. So the JSON that's prepared by the client will eventually end up in the marketplace contract. So when I say we're preparing JSON, what I mean is we're going to prepare some sale conditions. So these are going to govern how my NFT can be sold. So in order to have an open number of bids for near, I'm going to add zero as the price uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to specify near tokens. Um, so now I see that my pending sale update is open and near, but if the marketplace, um, and by the way, this, this isn't, finalized yet uh this works on the contract so so i'm going to add a different i get different currency type so let me just go ahead and do that first so i'm gonna say that uh i am open to any bids in near tokens but i am i am i am willing to immediately accept 10 dot as as my as my uh payment so if a user pays 10 DAI, it'll transfer the NFT. Uh, otherwise, I will accept bids in near tokens. So how does this information actually get into the contract? And by the way, the, the marketplace contract and the NFT contract have been tested for multiple, well, it's not the NFT contract. It's really the marketplace contract is tested for multiple token types using fungible tokens. So those are near standard fungible tokens which could also be bridge tokens. So I just want to let the viewers know um, the marketplace contract can actually uh, uh, specify sale conditions in fungible tokens. Currently right now, the one that I deployed only accepts near. So this, this update will, will not work, but I want to show you an example of how you would add multiple types and, and talk about how this works. So I'm on the marketplace front end. So I'm, I'm inside some, some front end that is connected probably by the same developer with the marketplace contract. So the marketplace front end is going to prepare um, just a, a JSON object, like a, a plain old JavaScript object that basically says, uh, it says near zero. And it says, you know, uh, die token contract account ID on near. So, so some, some account ID. So maybe it's like die dot ERC 20 factory dot near. And that maps to the value of 10 plus whatever die decimals there are. So maybe it's like 18 decimals. So a 10 with, um, you know, 18 zeros attached to it in a stringified form. So what happens is, that gets turned into some JSON on this front end. Then the client, so the user who actually has their wallet connected, in this case, I'm si1.testnet, the client makes a request to, um, to the NFT contract saying, I would like you, I am the owner of this NFT, I would like you to approve 
this marketplace. And, and by the way, I have a memo, like a message for the marketplace when you approve the marketplace. And the NFT contract will take that stringified JSON object of the sale conditions and pass it through to the marketplace contract. So again, it goes from the front end, specify your sale conditions, stringify, make a request to the NFT contract where you own the NFT to approve the marketplace and then go from the marketplace. And, and this happens in a cross contract call. So the user doesn't need to approve a second transaction. The NFT contract will call the marketplace with that same JSON payload. What happens at the marketplace contract is that the JSON will get unpacked, like deserialized into a struct that basically defines the sale conditions. So if I, I, I won't be able to do this here because, well, this is going to fail because there's no die. There's no die contract. It's going to probably produce an error. Yeah. So I'll go back and I'll put it up for sale for near only. So let's say, or I'll leave it open for bids. So I'll, I'll leave this one open for bids. It says update now, but I'll just show you. Here I am back at the same screen, only one currency type near, which is the only currency type that the marketplace supports. So by the way, the marketplace received that JSON from before and was like panicking. It was like, I, I don't know. I don't know what die is, you know? So it basically said, I, I don't do die transfers. So sorry, uh, you know, transaction canceled. So I'm going to update the sale conditions here. So now uh, it does know what near is. So near and, uh, oh, it failed. I don't know why. What's going on? <laughs> Let me just check the explore. Let's see what's up. I may have done something stupid, but... Uh, Oh, there is no not valid missing field sale conditions. Okay, so something happened. We something weird happened with the the front end. It didn't. Uh, I don't know. Didn't have the right information. Maybe I have a a bug or something. Maybe I introduced something. I'm gonna hit this update now thing because that that's what was working before. Okay, so that looked like it was successful. Um, I don't know what happened, something with the UI on that one, but um, basically, uh, yeah. So it's up for sale now, uh, open, near. Um, so yeah, so when it's up for sale, <laughs> this is so funny, people are, there's more people than me are, are putting this up, uh, are putting NFTs on this, this app. Okay, so once it's up for sale, um, basically what happens now is it's, it's an open bidding for near. So uh, let me go actually go to one that, okay, that's open bidding. Here's five near. Okay, so three, three outcomes here. Um, so one is, um, so somebody first offers uh, one near. I have to actually have a bid in order to show you how the other, other offers work. So then this person offers 0 0.5 near. This will fail because it's less than the current bid. So I think this, this might just, yeah, this ends up being an error. I, now, now, should I handle this in the UI before the user even gets to that screen? Of course, but have I done that? No. <laughs> so, so there's three outcomes. One, you do not bid enough. Uh, two, you bid, you bid more than the current offer, and in which case the other person gets their, their near back. I also, by the way, oh yeah, so you can outbid yourself. Well, that's kind of cool. I thought I put an assertion where you couldn't outbid yourself, but I guess I didn't. Um, might be an interesting idea, uh, but I mean, if you want to keep going up, then that's fine too. Now, the other outcome that can happen is when it's actually um, what I call when it's like a price sale, you can pay exactly five, um, five near and you can make that offer. And by the way, that Chad Lamon uh, specified that he gets 5% uh, royalties in perpetuity. So you'll see that there's some, there was some, I, so I own this now. So, and it's not for sale. So it just doesn't have any info there. 
Uh, now it's in my NFTs and now I can put it up for sale for 10. Um, now Chad Lamon will get 5% of 10 near. So uh, maybe Vadim, could you buy it um, from me for 10 near? Or make a bid actually. No, 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 Vadim, make a bid. Make a bid for five near. Okay, I'm doing it right now. Okay. But I will have a failure, right? Will you see it? No, no, no. Make a make a bid. Just make an offer for five near. You okay. don't have to pay 10 near. I'm gonna accept your offer. Done. Okay. So if I go to the marketplace, I see an offer five near by Zaffodil. So I'm gonna accept. I'm gonna accept your offer. So uh, that's gonna actually transfer it. So I don't have that NFT anymore. It's owned by you. Um, but now this is the interesting part. Let's go to the Explorer. I think Chad has another one here. I forgot his username already. Chad Lamont. Chad Lamont. Right. Yeah. So if we go to Chad Lamont.testnet and we look, uh, so this is me. Uh, or sorry, the marketplace made accept an accept offer. So I accepted an offer from Vadim of five near. But what's really cool about this is that um, the seller, which was me, got the remainder. Chad Lamont got 5% of five near. And also, by the way, the NFT contract always takes a perpetual royalty. So it's 5%, 5%, and then 90%. So 90% of five is uh, 4.5. So great. So everything happened according to plan. Um, so that's kind of how that works. It's, um, I just want to let uh, the viewers know too, um, I am not, I am not here trying to show you the best NFT app on the planet. I am not here to compete with the likes of, you know, Mintbase or OpenSea or whatever. Um, this is an example app that is intended to be cloned and copied and stolen and used by anyone, change the contracts, change anything. Um, the contracts are, I mean, the, the marketplace contract is unaudited. So use at your own risk, no warranty, et cetera. But you can also modify the NFT contract and the marketplace contract to do a lot more interesting things than what is on display here. So different auction types, different primary sales, all sorts of stuff. Um, the last thing I would say about this as well is that um, with respect to royalties, a lot of people get really sensitive about who gets what royalty and at what time, and is it the gross sale or is it the, you know, just the price appreciation? That's up to you. I, I have zero opinion about how you know, you should do your royalties or how you want your royalties to be paid out. But anyway, that's, uh, so I guess deal with it is a good, is a good, um, a good sort of meme to have up while I was explaining, <laughs> explaining that part. Um, yeah. So it, I, if that answers, uh, so Zahar, the beginning of this video, this long explainer video about NFT market repo, was actually coming from a question from Zahar about how this whole mechanism of sale arguments works and how they get passed through the NFT contract to the marketplace contract. So I just want to open it back up to uh, Zahar, see if we answer that question and maybe Vadim for like four, for like more questions. And if not, I mean, or after those questions, we'll go into the actual application code itself, which is a React application, and we'll look at each individual uh, call, including, you know, getting the gallery and making available all of the UI stuff and just looking at that in a, a bit more detail. But does that answer your question, Zahar? Oh, yes, perfectly. Thank you so much. Uh, that answers my question, yes. Um, let's move on with, uh, to the code. Thank you. The, uh, the dean, Zahar, the dean, am before, I, am we, I... before we move on, do you have questions about like just the app, like the interface or anything like that? Yeah, uh, as far as I understood uh, how Zahar asked questions, he asked, can we check from the transaction or from the interface what are we exactly approving? 
For example, if we have any extension, maybe malicious extension, and it will just update price or something, can we see somehow what exactly do we send to, to the blockchain? Which like for example, uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, my uh, point was that uh, when I set the price here or whatever, then uh, I cannot see it in the in the wallet. Uh, but I, I, yeah, so here you see it just says requesting your authorization, and basically that's it. And uh, uh, you don't see pretty much anything here uh, apart of the the contracts of the parties. But those contracts are uh, probably yeah, not too much descriptive. Uh, uh, yeah, that was my concern, but it's not concerned to, towards the application. I understood that it's concerned towards the uh, the wallet UI. Uh, just so, so, someone requests my authorization for something, uh, I give it, but I'm not sure as a user uh, for what I have consented. That was the peculiarity. Hey, that's Otherwise, a good yeah, point. Yeah. That's a good point. And this uh, this this question about uh, I just tried to change the the sale conditions. It should have done it. It should have done two transactions back to back. It should have done like a batch transaction, but it didn't. And uh, here you can see that you're putting it up for sale. It's obviously really, it's obviously like not a great kind of UI experience to have to do this, you know, more information thing. Yeah, probably um, we, uh, we could set another standard later that if we uh, if we encode some uh, parameters, some arguments, uh, kind of if we prefix it, for example, uh, user underscore consent, and then whatever other uh, name uh, we put, then UI can handle uh, such uh, magic names uh, in a different way and uh, make them more explicit and uh, somehow, somehow highlight them for the user that this is what you're uh, consenting on, uh, something like that. But th this is an idea for the future development of the wallet. Yeah, I actually, I like that, Zahar. I think that's really cool is um, this idea that the developer is going to, the developer is going to be sending some arguments uh, with their transaction. And then if they, if they include, for example, like uh, some sort of a, a special argument that gets that gets ignored by the contract runtime, but it gets it somehow gets picked up by like it it gets picked up by the wallet. Um, that way, what we could do because because the thing is the wallet is only showing what's in this hash right here. True. It's like a hash of the transaction, right? Like it's a transaction, it's a signed transaction payload, really, and that's how the wallet is showing is showing this. Um, the thing that we could do is maybe we work with the wallet layer. Maybe it's something a little bit more complicated. Like we work with the RPC layer, we like strip it out. So we have, we have any argument that is prefixed with underscore is ignored once it hits the actual smart contract runtime. So that could be an option. And then that way we can send quote unquote magic arguments to something like the wallet, the wallet can pick it up and say, oh, you know, you really want to show the user what's happening here. So let's, you know, let's do this, right? Um, let's show them here, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah, I agree with, I agree exactly. with you. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I found a little bug actually. So I don't know if you guys noticed, but yeah, it was supposed to happen relatively seamlessly. Like when I, when I update my sale, Unfortunately, I mean, I do have an update price method. Um, actually, wait, I, I should just use that method, shouldn't I? Like I'm, I'm doing, I'm removing the sale and then re-adding the sale. It's like really garbage. <laughs> um, I should just use that. So hang on one sec. Um, I have a problem with parcel cash too. If you guys know any secrets there, let me know because I've, I've tried everything to just... I'm using like parcel 2.0 though. So I'm living on the edge. Um, basically, let's take a look here. So I have an NFT. It's all ready for sale. I'm going to get rid of the other window here. Um, I'm on localhost now because I'm going to change. So if I want to modify the sale, I'll show you the bug first. I say update now. And, and the first transaction is removing the sale. 
but then it comes back to the app and it doesn't do the second transaction. Obviously that sucks, right? So I don't want to, so now it's not for sale and now I have to put it up for sale again. That's stupid, right? So what I want to do is I want to do actually, I'll just accept this. I want to do an update price call. So I'm in the gallery and this is handle sale update. So if there is a sale and then I'll just do else add a sale. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stick with the, the fact that it's in near right now. Well, I know it's in near cause it's, it's uh, I've got the token ID or it should update the price of any token. Let's go to the contract. So it's under market um, sale and let's look at update price. Here it is. So NFT contract, the token ID, the fungible token ID and the price. So I do need to know the fungible token ID before I can update this. So if I go down here again, uh, yeah, we're going to look at this code in a bit. It is not, it's not the prettiest. Um, but it works. <laughs> so the fungible token ID is here, handle sale update. So we'll do this token ID, fungible token ID, new sale conditions. So under handle here, we'll take in all three of those arguments. And then what we'll do is we'll pass the fungible token ID through here. Uh, no, whoops, that's the wrong one. We want to do, oh no, that is the, that's the right area. So if there's a sale, we're going to call update price. And here we're going to take in not the sale uh, conditions. We're just going to take in the new price. So what we do is we go get new sale conditions. I think, sorry, the argument was price. Yeah. So we're going to say, okay. So now it's just going to, it's just going to pluck out the price amount from this hash map, um, or it's a JSON object, and it's going to feed it into the price field and then just move the key for which token it is up to the FT token ID argument. And then the rest is the same. We have to specify which NFT contract and which token we're actually wanting to update. Um, and by the way, in the contract, it does do a check here for update price, it checks to make sure that I, uh, I'll zoom in a bit here. It checks to make sure that I am the uh, sale owner. So uh, this assertion makes sure that only the owner of the sale, which again is only, only added if NFT approve calls the marketplace contract. So we know that the owner is the owner. So only the owner can update the price. Similarly, only the owner can remove the sale um, and certain other kind of like, you know, properties of the marketplace should be only the sale owner. Um, so I'm going to save that and we're going to try to do a update price in one transaction instead of two. So let's do that. So let's change it to four. It says update now. Okay. Oh, FT token ID not defined gallery. It's uh, finding it down here somewhere. Uh, here, FT token ID, it didn't like that. Um, so that is, oh, that's just in the sale conditions. So, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take in so I'm going to get rid of that arg. Sorry, I got a little distracted. So what we'll do is we'll just say, um, if there is already a sale, uh, we're updating the price and this is going to really actually kind of cannibalize the UI a little bit, but um, it's not going to handle multiple tokens, but uh, I, I'm, I'm okay with it because I'm only handling near for now. I'm going to add bridge tokens and we'll talk, we'll probably be able to talk about that next week. We'll have multiple token types. For now, I'm just going to deal with this uh, like this. It's not great, but it'll work. Okay. So my NFTs, uh, where did my NFT go? Is it on sale? Oh, it is on sale. Uh, it's here. Why is it not showing up here? Sorry, my NFTs, where is it? 
do I still, oh, did somebody buy it? Did you guys buy it? Somebody pranking me here? <laughs> somebody bought it. Okay, so while I was trying to update the price of this NFT, somebody mm -hmm. has now bought the NFT. So that's why I'm confused. Okay, so I guess don't do this on a live contract. Um, anyway, so I own this. So once again, there's no sale. So I'm gonna sell it for two near. And then the second transaction I make is going to update the price. So, but remember, we want to we want to go to my NFTs and we want to update the price without making two transactions. So this should just be an update price call. So if we go to more information, it says price FT token ID. Oh, shoot, that's not going to work, is it? Uh, no, because price needs to be an amount. Oh, that's weird. Uh, oh, it's an array. That's why. Sorry. You guys have to deal with my bad coding. Uh, it wasn't uh, a hash map. It was an array. <laughs> so, um, oh, here. This is actually really funky now. Apologies. Uh, it's like super messy code now. But uh, basically, I just make sure I got the, the latest one. All right, it should be a proper update price now with proper args. There we go. So, oh no, <laughs> the FT token ID is price. Boy, I really don't remember what the structure of this array is uh, or what this thing is. Um, new sale conditions. I totally forget what this looks like, actually. I think it comes with like two, uh, two pieces to it. Hold on. Um, I know I have to go through with it. I oh, know it's undefined. I don't know what's going on now. Yeah, it's an array of an object. I thought I thought that that would, that would work. Hmm. I'm kind of confused by this. Hang on one sec, sorry. Um, let's do this. What is this? It's price, oh, oh boy. Yeah, it's an object, so okay. I don't need to do any of this weird weird crap. Okay. Sorry. Uh, one of the, one of the, one of the, um, structures here, I think bidding, bidding is done in a hash map, but sale args is done as an array. It's, it's terrible. It's like actually not good. I, I may update that in the future, but, um, yeah. Uh, it should actually be, to be honest, both of them should be hash maps. Like, so, uh, what I what I meant to say was that when you make a bid, you make a bid with a token type, colon like colon price. So it's like just a hash map of a bid. Um, and then uh, when you when you upload um, when you upload new sale conditions, it's like it's like an array of objects. It's it's really it's kind of a little bit of a mess. Um, anyway, this should all work now. So let's uh, update the price of that NFT. So once again, we're going back. We want to make one transaction to change that price to three. This all looks correct uh, to me. So allow. And then we're going to go back and the price of that NFT should be three. Yay. Okay. So <laughs> that was really, that was really bad because I completely forgot the, the structure of that object uh, sale conditions. So anyway, so that now calls the update price. But of course, this is the issue is that the user, I don't know which, I don't know which currency the user actually currently wants to change the price of. So um, again, on the UI, it's going to get a little, a little messy. It's not going to be perfect. Um, I'll show you what that looks like though, and why that's actually the way that I structured this isn't actually, it's not the best. Um, 
there's a um there's like purchase args sale args which is a vector of these price objects but i I guess it's okay, but to be honest, uh, this should really have just been a hash map. So it should have just been hash map um, account ID price or you know U one twenty eight. Um, so it should have been something like that. And I kind of messed that up a little bit in the in the beginning, like a long. I I added sale args a long 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 time ago. Um, so it's just a little bit. It's kind of a little bit uh, a little bit odd that it's a vector of it's a vector of something that essentially could just be collapsed to like a single hash map, um, which is which is kind of annoying. But um, but no worries. Let's talk through the actual app itself. So let's go like high level um, and let's uh, let's take this app that we're looking at here. Um, let's look at the marketplace. So we see owned by Vadim owned by Chad Lamont. Chad Lamont is going to take a 20% perpetual royalty. It is open for bidding in near tokens. So I'm going to offer two near. I'm going to approve that. And uh, basically, uh, you can see my offer here now. And if you were, if you were the account chadlamont.testnet, there would be an approve button next to this offer. And if Chad Lamont wanted to sell this right now to me for too near, he could accept the offer and it would, and the NFT would transfer. And the, because it's owned by Chad Lamont and there's a 20% royalty for Chad Lamont, it will actually, when the NFT transfer payout method calculates the royalties, it will see that Chad Lamont is the current owner. And so it will not add the 20% payout to Chad Lamont.testnet. Instead, it will give the remainder to Chad Lamont.testnet. So that basically um, the payouts that go back to the marketplace contract are, are a hash map. You can't have identical entries. So basically, Chad Lamont will go back to the marketplace contract. Um, minus the NFT contract royalty of 5%. Uh, so Chad Lamont will get 95% and the NFT contract will get 5%. If, if I was selling the NFT, here's what's going to happen. It's I, someone's going to offer, you know, five near if I'm selling it because I'm better than Chad. Just kidding. Um, but basically if I'm selling the NFT, but Chad Lamont gets a 20% fee, like royalty fee, what will get sent in the um, payouts to the marketplace contract will be 5% uh, to the NFT contract, 20% to Chad Lamont, and the remainder will go to me, so 75%. So I will have to sell this NFT uh, for basically, uh, you know, whatever it is, it's like, um, uh, like one divided by 0.75 more than what I paid for it. So it will have to sell for like one, I don't know what the, how that math works out. It's like one point, one point something percent, like 1.333%, I think. It's like, uh, anyone know that off the top of their head? One, I'm so bad with this stuff. It's to one and quarter, one and 25%. No, it's 1.33. It always gets okay. a bit bigger. So basically, Let's say I bought it from Chad for 10 near. I have to sell it for, for more. I have to sell it for 13.33 near or greater in order to actually get back my full 10 near at least. So that's kind of how this works uh, because the payouts are done on like the gross price of the NFT transfer. Now the question comes, why not make the payouts based on the last price paid? And that's fine, provided that you're only accepting one currency type. So every time you calculate NFT transfer payouts, let's go, let's go to the NFT contract actually, just really quick. Um, it's not that. Yeah, here's NFT transfer payout. So every time you call NFT transfer payout, you tell it the balance 
that you paid, okay? Now here's the trick. The trick is if you wanna store the last price, you can. You can take this balance field and you can store it on, on the token itself. But the problem is what happens when Vadim buys a token from me for, for 10 die, and then I go to sell it for 10 near, right? The last price is, is I only have a reference to the die price. I don't have a reference to the price in near. And so at this point, you would need to uh, actually have an Oracle and you can't, you can't do it with just the client side because anyone from the client side to the NFT contract could lie. Uh, so myself included. So I could say, I could say, for example, that there was, uh, you know, very little price appreciation because I don't want to pay royalties on price appreciation. So if royalties are only paid on the difference from like 10 near to 11 near, I don't like, I don't want to, I, I would only pay royalties on the one near that was made in profit. So I, I, I have every incentive to say that the last price was really expensive. Um, so you need, you basically need a third party, like Oracle, like some sort of decentralized provider of, of the last price. Um, so again, I, I realize this isn't a great uh, place to kind of end this discussion, but this is the, uh, this is the reality that we live in. This is like how this stuff kind of works. But do you have a, uh, do you want another one question? Another question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, w when you created um, metadata for the NFT, you you added uh, 0 0.01 near to save it, right? Am I right? Uh, are you talking about adding uh, the royalties? You, yeah, no, you, you, you attach uh, 0 0.01 near when you create the token oh, yeah, to save yeah. the metadata. But when we update the token, for example, we set a new price, we still uh, attaching 0 0.01 near, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah, so when you, okay, so good question. When you mint the token, you attach 0 0.1 near, actually, 0 0.1. Okay. When you go to add the token to the sale contract, you attach 0 0.01 near. Um, this is... Uh, yeah, actually, I don't think I actually need that extra 0 0.01, Vadim, but, but let's talk about two different things at once, okay? So let's talk about minting first. So at the end of, at the end of minting, you're going to get a refund of any, um, any of the attached deposit that you didn't use. So when you mint the token and you attach 0 0.1 near, you're covered up to 10 kilobytes of storage, which is a lot, right? Like that's that could be a gigantic URL to some huge image, right? Um, and basically uh, your refund is, um, your refund is whatever you didn't use in contract storage to create that NFT and that NFT is metadata. So, so that answers question one, why am I attaching 0 0.1 near when I mint and what, what, what actually gets used? Well, whatever is used for, for storage at that time. Um, the second question about the marketplace is, oh, sorry, it's here, NFT Simple. It's still part of, of NFT Simple here. It's when you approve, uh, it's up here. Oh no, it's down here, sorry. Um, when you call NFT approve, um, yeah, similarly, actually, you um, you actually have to, store an approval for the marketplace in the nft contract and i've and then and then you have to call the sale contract but i don't do anything with the sale contract in terms of storage i just take i took a storage deposit of 0 0.1 near and i said okay you get 10 kilobytes and you can add i think i have an upper limit of like 50 sales so i i didn't do it as as explicitly as Eugene did it with the exact storage amounts. I just took like a blanket deposit and I said, okay, I'm the marketplace. I'll take 50 sales for 0 0.1 near in terms of, of storage. Um, anyway, long story short, um, you will, um, 
you will get a refund of the deposit that you gave uh, for whatever storage you didn't use. So each time you approve the marketplace, you're going to transfer 0 0.1 near 0. Point, or sorry, 0 0.01 near to the NFT contract. And whatever the NFT contract doesn't use to store that account ID of the marketplace, it will send back to you. So if you've already put it in the approved account IDs list, it'll, it'll just come back to you. Anyway, that, that, that's just some stuff around storage and like storage rent. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, I just forgot that we have to store uh, this approval. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's, thank you. Yeah. Um, may you shortly come back to the uh, payout uh, topic? Yeah. Very shortly, yeah. Um, why you prefer to operate with the, I, I, I honestly did not uh, get the concept uh, or the problem of uh, um, storing the old value. Uh, as per my understanding, typically, uh, we just need to uh, get a hint uh, in which proportions, so in which percentages, should we split the money that were received from the uh, from the uh, buyer. So if uh, we sold the item for ten years or ten dice or ten whatever else, uh, NFT marketplace just probably needs a hint how to distribute the money. Why cannot we, uh, instead of operating with the absolute values, uh, reuse our fraction uh, fraction model uh, uh, that we use for for royalty definition, and just say that, uh, uh, hey, marketplace, please divide uh, divide the money the following way, and then we just uh, give a hash map of fractions, uh, how the marketplace should divide whatever it has uh, received from the uh, from the buyer. That, so that is what it's doing right now. Um, so, so we're talking about two different things and I just wanna make sure that we're talking about the right one. What I was talking about, uh, just a sec, I just gotta get rid of the sun, <laughs> getting burned up here. Uh, so what I was talking about Zahar was not what is currently implemented. Um, what I was talking about was how you would theoretically only pay percentages of the price appreciation. So, uh -huh, yes, so, sorry, so my poor English, yeah. I, I, I missed that, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the, but, but how you described it is exactly how it works now. Basically, so we're talking about gross revenues or net revenues from the sale, right? Like, so if I buy an NFT for 10 and I sell it for 15, there's five near or five mm -hmm. whatever that are that are up for uh, net revenue, but there's fifteen per, there's fifteen uh, units of gross revenue, right? Correct. Yes. Um, yeah. So right now, all royalties are being paid out of gross revenue. Um, the the theoretical sort of uh, world or the hypothetical that I was presenting was how would one go about um, creating an NFT contract that could that could support um, payouts of net revenue only, so only the price appreciation, but also support multiple collateral types, like multiple mm -hmm. currencies, right? That right, yeah, becomes understood. a real problem because if I buy a token for 10 near and then I go and I sell it for, you know, a hundred die tokens, when you go to look at the last sale or, or if you stored this historical balance, even if you put in a memo like here that said the last balance that came in from the, the marketplace told me the last balance was, was uh, you know, 10 and, and also said that it was in near tokens. Even if you have that information, when I go to sell it to somebody and, and Vadim buys it from me for, for 100 die. We have no idea what the difference is between 100 die and 10 near, and neither does the contract. So nobody yes, knows. That's, yeah, that's what we, a, I, now I what we was, could yeah, do, yeah. what we could do, which is really cool, now that we have ref finance, we could call to ref finance and we could say, we could say, okay, you know, the NFT contract's going to do the be do the best it can to calculate the net revenue here. And it's going to come back with a response from ref finance that says, um, hey, you know, according to the current uh, near die pool, you know, you could swap uh, this much die 
for this much near. So uh, we're going to say that this much or this much near is worth this much die. So we're going to say that the last price in near is now worth this much in die. And now we're going to start to calculate net revenue. But I mean, like, <laughs> I know we're recording, but I just want to say, holy shit, <laughs> it starts to become, it starts to become a big, a big complicated mess, right? So I think the idea is gross revenue royalties already done nice and simple everyone can kind of wrap their heads around it artist makes some small percentage two three four five percent in perpetuity of every gross sale amount which i think is a it's a pretty easy way to wrap your head around it right but it does by the way it does restrict it does restrict every flipping of the NFT. So, so let's say you're flipping, you're flipping NFTs on sales. You're trying to sell it back and forth and back and forth amongst collectors. Every sale must appreciate by uh, by basically uh, you know one divided by one minus the perpetual royalties. So it would have to, like we saw in the example, and it's not that intuitive. So the um, the price appreciation here, uh, if you had 25% perpetual royalties, the price appreciate, uh, sorry, the flip, the flip would have to generate that much more in gross sale amount. Um, so that part is not as intuitive, right? So if you look at something and it says perpetual royalties, you, you have to kind of back calculate for the user. I actually should include it in the UI. I should include something like if this says 20%, I should put, and if you're not the owner here, I should put something like for each offer, for example, so two is obviously not that great. And if this previous, sorry, if, uh, oh no, I need to know what it previously sold for then. <laughs> I talked myself into a corner, but, but anyway, you guys get the point. I, I want to calculate some sort of a, you know, you paid this, and then if it sells for this, you will receive this minus the perpetual royalties. Does that all kind of track for you guys? Yeah, yeah. that's that, that that's became clear. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're in a we're in a dangerous game here talking about artist royalties. <laughs> everyone everyone gets really uh, religious about what they think someone should get paid, you know. Um, but anyway, that's so. So that's it. I think we did a pretty good a pretty good walkthrough of the market earlier, and and especially this complicated like uh, the, this price updating one was. Sorry, I got stuck there a little bit, but it should now be really fluid. So I fixed the price update bug. If you want to update now, it it updates with one transaction as opposed to removing the sale and then putting in a new sale. So it actually uses the update price method. So it's four near now. And while we were talking, somebody uploaded a copyrighted image that uh, will probably cause me to get a notice on GitHub. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, anyway, yeah, any more questions? Not at this point in time. Thank you so much, Matt, for a very, very clear explanation. Willem, you, you joined. How you doing? Doing well. I enjoyed it. I, uh, it makes sense to me that... Uh, Paras now I added the royalty. Um, I, I think another cool idea is that you could um, stake the the piece at the price that you went after the sale, and then the uh, the artist would receive the uh, the royalties from staking rewards. I like that actually. Yeah. So so you're saying when the artist sells. Uh, the original, so so on the let's say on the first sale, what what I call like the primary sale, yeah. the the sale happens, and then the artist tokens are immediately staked um, on their behalf, right? Uh, I yeah. mean, it's yeah, and then and then they earn staking rewards. That's that's a cool idea. Yeah, and then as it grows, and then you know it, you'd have to like, you know, I don't know if 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 uh, you'd have to wait for an unstaking, but. Maybe maybe it's just an additional stake of like you know the difference. So you just stake more money each time, <laughs> um, and then yeah, 
and then the rewards. Well, yeah, you can Not keep right. uh, you can keep staking and staking and staking, presumably, right? Yeah. Uh, could you guys hear any uh, any noise while I was recording? Well, I'm still recording, but could you hear any noise? Actually, uh, did you hear like a drilling noise? I heard police car once. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, my microphone's pretty good, but I don't know. Somebody was like doing some banging or something. No, it was fine. <laughs> Fil filtered it out. All right, so I think we're all done for the live app review kind of portion. Um, next week, we will go into a little bit more of the code and hopefully, fingers crossed, I've got a lot of like partner stuff to do in order to get these, uh, these NFT things launched on mainnet. But hopefully, fingers crossed, I will actually... Um, I will add uh, the bridge test token. So there's a test token called TST that's released by, I don't know who it is. It's just like a test ERC20 token or something. But basically you can go, if you need these tokens, you can just go to like, you can go to Etherscan and you can go on Ropston or whatever. And you can just call, you can call it directly and it'll just spit out test tokens for you. And then what you do is you take it to the rainbow bridge and then you cross the rainbow bridge from, I think we're on Rinkaby, actually. Rinkaby, right? Somebody? Yeah. I think it's Rinkaby. So, think. so you get the test tokens on Rinkaby, not Robson. And then you cross the rainbow bridge on Rinkaby. And then you'll have TST tokens in your near wallet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add TST tokens to this NFT marketplace. And that, I swear, is the final iteration of my... Um, I think, I think Ilya said, uh, my, uh, Matt, let's not talk about your front end skills, NFT marketplace. <laughs> I don't think my front end looks that bad though. I mean, I've seen some, I've seen some, you know, technical reference implementation front ends that look a lot worse <laughs> than what I showed you guys today. So, um, so anyway, I'm hoping to use bridge tokens. I'm hoping to have uh, sales in at least two different currency types. And then that way, when that lock it into in, one, sorry, say that again. Well, will that lock it to one since you don't have a way to, to, you know, compare the prices. Well, that's a good question. I was thinking of, I was thinking of like, what, what should I, what should I value these other tokens as, and maybe just to keep it interesting um i'll say that the test tokens I'll, I'll i'll say the test tokens are a stable token and i'll pull i'll pull uh the us dollar feed of near from coin gecko for example and then what i'll do is i'll show i'll show on the nft market i'll sort them by okay you know it's too near which is greater than uh which is greater than 10 bucks or something so i'll i'll do something like that but it will just be a UI comparison and not an actual, there'll obviously be no contract kind of um, representation of like, you know, price feeds or oracles or anything like that. But I, I just want to show people that you can actually use fungible tokens with these contracts. Um, I demoed in a previous, uh, previous live app review, all of the sort of application, like uh, these are tests run with Jest. So it's kind of like front end simulation tests of like Alice and Bob and Alice gets fungible tokens. Bob says he wants to sell an NFT for, you know, 20 fungible tokens. Alice buys it with 20 fungible tokens, things like this. Uh, all of those tests on the NFT market repo currently work and they, they demonstrate um, you know, they demonstrate it working. I just have not moved to an example where the test token is not a token that, that I deploy. It's a token that just floats out there, you know, somewhere. So I have to basically just use the, the bridge test tokens because, you know, why not? Right. Um, yeah. that'll be, that'll be fun. <laughs> fun. Yeah. Ish. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's stop recording and uh, we can just keep chatting for another five minutes or so.